In the 1964-81 period, there was a tremendous increase in the rates on long-term government bonds, which moved from just over 4% at year-end 1964 to more than 15% by late 1981. That rise in rates had a huge depressing effect on the value of all investments, but the one we noticed, of course, was the price of equities. So there in that tripling of the gravitational pull of interest rates lies, the major explanation of why tremendous growth in the economy was accompanied by a stock market going nowhere. Then, in the early 1980s, the situation reversed itself. You will remember Paul Volcker coming in as chairman of the Fed, and remember also how unpopular he was. But the heroic things he did his taking a 2 by 4 to the economy, and breaking the back of inflation caused the interest rate trend to reverse, with some rather spectacular results. Let's say you put $1 million into the 14% 30-year US bond issued November 16, 1981, and reinvested the coupons. That is, every time you got an interest payment, you used it to buy more of that same bond. At the end of 1998, with long-term governments by then selling at 5%, you would have had $8,181,219 and would have earned an annual return of more than 13%. That 13% annual return is better than stocks have done in a great many 17-year periods in history and most 17-year periods, in fact. It was a hell of a result, and from none other than a stodgy bond. The power of interest rates had the effect of pushing up equities as well, though other things that we will get to push additionally. And so here's what equities did in that same 17 years. If you'd invested $1 million in the Dow on November 16, 1981, and reinvested all dividends, you'd have had $19,720,112 on December 31, 1998. And your annual return would have been 19%. The increase in equity values since 1981 beats anything you can find in history. This increase even surpasses what you would have realized if you'd bought stocks in 1932, at their depression bottom on its lowest day, July 8, 1932, the Dow closed at 41 points, and held them for 17 years. The second thing bearing on stock prices during this 17 years was after-tax corporate profits, which this chart displays as a percentage of GDP. In effect, what this chart tells you is what portion of the GDP ended up every year with the shareholders of American business. The chart, as you will see, starts in 1929. I'm quite fond of 1929, since that's when it all began for me. My dad was a stock salesman at the time, and after the crash came, in the fall, he was afraid to call anyone all those people who'd been burned. So he just stayed home in the afternoons. And there wasn't television then. So, I was conceived on or about November 30th, 1929, and born nine months later, on August 30th, 1930, and I forever had a kind of warm feeling about the crash. As you can see, corporate profits as a percentage of GDP peaked in 1929, and then they tanked. The left-hand side of the chart, in fact, is filled with aberrations. Not only the depression, but also wartime profits boom sedated by the excess profits tax and another boom after the war. But from 1951 on, the percentage settled down pretty much to a 4% to 6.5% range. By 1981, though, the trend was headed toward the bottom of that band, and in 1982, profits tumbled to 3.5%. So at that point investors were looking at two strong negatives. Profits were subpar, and interest rates were sky high. And as is so typical, investors projected out into the future what they were seeing. That's their unshakable habit. Looking into the rear view mirror instead of through the windshield. What they were observing, looking backward, made them very discouraged about the country. They were projecting high interest rates, they were projecting low profits, and they were therefore valuing the Dow at a level that was the same as 17 years earlier, even though GDP had nearly quintupled. Now, what happened in the 17 years beginning with 1982? One thing that didn't happen was comparable growth in GDP. In this second 17-year period, GDP less than tripled. But interest rates began their descent, and after the Volcker effect wore off, profits began to climb not steadily, but nonetheless with real power. You can see the profit trend in the chart, which shows that by the late 1990s, after tax profits as a percent of GDP were running close to 6%, which is on the upper part of the normalcy band. And at the end of 1998, long-term government interest rates had made their way down to that 5%. These dramatic changes in the two fundamentals that matter most to investors explain much, though not all, of the more than tenfold rise in equity prices. The Dow went from 875 points to 9,181 points during this 17-year period. What was at work also, of course, was market psychology. Once a bull market gets underway, and once you reach the point where everybody has made money no matter what system he or she followed, a crowd is attracted into the game. 